Hello guys, uh, welcome to the Variable Resistance live stream. Uh, let me just get us going here. Got a slightly different setup this week. Um, trying to do this in proper HD. So um, there might be a little bit of some snags here and there, but hopefully it will um, work out nicely. Um, yes, so today uh, I thought we would jump into some programming uh, topics. Um, because that's what I'm doing most of the time. Um, and uh, I'm starting up a game. I've been doing a lot of research on various aspects of the game that I need to tackle. Um, one of the biggest things about the game, well, there's a bunch of things that I want to do, but at the core of what I want to do is make, sorry, a lot of clutter on my desk. At the core of what I want to do is uh, make a game that works well uh, on mobile as a 2D experience, so as a side-scroller of sorts. I'm going to try out this fun little apparatus for uh, drawing. Uh, essentially, you know, with your typical 2D platformers, you have um, some sort of ground elements, whatever, and you have your little guy and you have an annoying little d-pad especially in these new mobile games and you have to like spend all this time or i guess it would be over here since i'm flipping things <laughs> um, you know it might be on either side uh, based on whether you're right-handed or left-handed there's lots of you know old concepts of this that uh essentially don't make a lot of sense in a mobile uh, if you're on an iPad or an iPhone or something like that on the go, um, you can't. Uh, I mean, you're going to be looking at a touch screen quite a bit when you're um, doing, you know, something on an iPad or an iPhone. But uh, I think eventually, if the right kind of games come around, uh, the right kind of experiences come around, there's things that can be done on these without uh, having to look at the screen. Specifically, once uh, it becomes more. Uh, of an open standard and a little faster to push, uh, say, the device over AirPlay to, say, your TV through an Apple TV or to your computer uh, once that becomes uh, just something that's coming in the next version of Lion, supposedly. Uh, so I'm really curious about that space. I'm really curious about, uh, you know, what, what would happen if you had an iPad in your hand. And you didn't have to be fumbling around for a D-pad. Uh, what if the characters, uh, you know, the character is a little bit more free in the space, and it's a little bit more, uh, you know, up to you to draw with your finger, uh, you know, where you might want um, the the character to go, and uh, or where you want it to go to do things, or to build things, or to destroy things, or attack things, or whatever. Uh, this doesn't seem to be being explored all that much so far. So, I'm very interested in that. I'm very interested in the possibilities with that. Um, but what does that mean for uh, a traditional sort of 2D platform or a 2D uh, side-scroller type of game? Um, it's, it's really fun to see a lot of these games come back into, uh, into popularity, even though we have like all these fast processors and we have 3D rendering and all this other stuff. People still like those types of games because I think there's a certain uh, a certain fun to a constrained environment, uh, and so I'm very interested in playing with that. So anyway, let me get a couple things out of the way here, and I'll switch my windows over. Still working on getting some hotkeys set up for all of this, so that we can do this a little easier. But. Uh, so essentially, we're going to spend some time in Xcode today. For those of you who are not familiar with Xcode, it is a programming environment by Apple. Um, you can do a lot of different types of coding in Xcode. Uh, we're going to be doing some C++ today. Kind of not really hardcore C++, don't worry. Um, you can also do Objective-C and iPhone programming, things like that. I'm using something called Open Frameworks. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that, it is a creative coding uh, environment with a lot of um, a lot of fun support. 
uh, around it. A lot of good people, a lot of really brilliant, talented people, of which I wish I was as smart as. Um, openframeworks.cc. Oh, my camera just died, but that's okay. I'll turn it back on. Um, uh, openframeworks.cc is a good place to go check it out. There's also a really good um, uh, set of documentation out there for Open Frameworks. It's been getting better all the time. Um, I was very grumpy with uh, them for quite a while because it seemed like they were um, they were doing so many updates on GitHub, which is a, a, a repository um, system for you know group uh, group projects. And they're just updating all the time, updating all the time, and things were breaking all the time, which is great, but then I was actually trying to finish some projects and keep them working, and I wasn't as good at Git at that point in time, so a lot of things were breaking. This is the one thing I'll say is risky about using any creative coding environment, is that you're at the mercy of the other developers to some degree, and it's also um, sort of your uh, duty as a fellow developer to not only uh, you know be part of the forums and part of the conversations or actually uh, trying to fix problems yourself or to be responsible um, in how you um, how you check out uh, the current build of something uh, make sure that it's good make sure it's not breaking uh, when you have a solid version of that not to not to you know be constantly updating on top of it just in case there's a break in there always keeping those things kind of available. Things like GitHub make it very easily, very easy to do that because you can go to different branches that have different, you know, tags in terms of being more or less stable. Um, but it is time consuming, so. I will say from uh, when I was more in my install days, um, keeping archives of IDEs and uh, libraries around, especially at the time that you built the project, to have that with the source code of the project in case it needs fixed later is invaluable because uh, you might find a year or two later not only are you trying to remember what your code was <clears throat> which can sometimes be daunting in itself but if there's new languages new things um, that have been added you know changes to the APIs or to uh, the various methods or whatnot uh, you can run into a lot of problems because and you just it's just uh, overwhelming to try to keep up with that so anyway um, uh, let's jump back into Xcode and we'll go from there. So um, one of the things that's nice about uh, Open Frameworks is that it has a really nice set of libraries. Um, processing is another creative coding environment. It has a really nice set of libraries also. Um, and uh, there's more and more libraries being added all the time. Uh, because of that, Sometimes it's hard to figure out exactly what you want to use in a project. Um, so one of the things I need to do in this uh, 2D uh, side-scroller game is I need, I need an environment where I have my character, it can react with objects in the world. Um, and this site, for example, is a very nice example of someone sort of talking at an algorithmic level about um, all of the things that go into simple collision detection. And there's some very, uh, you know, interesting to read code here, which will not, won't get into thetas and deltas and all of this geometry, trigonometry uh, stuff that, honestly, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a hardcore math person. I'm not a hardcore programmer person. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, the, I'm the, the more and more common everyday generalist sort of has a lot of interest, has a lot of things that they want to bring into the project person. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily wanting to reinvent the wheel here. And because of that, um, there's some great libraries out there that sort of take some of these abstractions and make them a lot less uh, abstract, a lot more uh, approachable to a developer that's not uh, you know, wanting to get right down to the very low level. Um, so Box2D is uh, a really great uh, library for this. Another library that's very good is um, Chipmunk. And really, these two libraries were originally created on, um, well, Box2D was, has sort of have, has a lot of support in the Flash, uh, the Flash world. A lot of people, it got adapted to Flash very early. A lot of people were using it in Flash games. 
Um, so because of that, you know, there's still quite a bit of Flash developers out there. There's a lot of support uh, from that community. Um, additionally, or in contrast, Chipmunk sort of came out of um, doing live Google searches. That's always a good idea. Um, Chipmunk is uh, you know lower level C. It is um, it, it was sort of touted as being a little faster, uh, a little more low level, a little bit more flexible when it came out. It had um, a few other things um, in it that made it really, really nice. I think Box 2D is caught up in a lot of ways, and the support for Box 2D is a little bit better. So I'd say whichever one, uh, you know, if you know one of them already, by all means use it. I, I'm using Box 2D just because I've, uh, at least for the purposes of today, because I have a little bit more experience of using it with it. I've used it in a couple uh, installations in the past, uh, and it kind of gets us up and running a little faster. So, so let's uh, jump back to Xcode here, and um, I'm realizing I don't have a good way to see the chat right now, so apologies for getting recursive here. I'm going to pop out the chat window real quick that I can at least see what you guys are saying, if you have any questions or not, since I want this to be a two-way thing. Uh, hopefully the chat pop-up window will actually work. I was having this problem earlier. Um, yeah, okay. So I hope that you guys can see it's on the screen here. Might need to go in and up the resolution a little bit here. And of course, I should have done this before. Bear with me. Uh, where is the size? Well, damn it. And I don't think I have accessibility features here. Sorry, one second. I'm going to be zooming in a bit here and there. Turn on universal access here. And let's see. Let's have this. There we go. Okay. And that should hopefully do what we need. Okay, so in any um, in any open frameworks uh, application, you will have three primary classes. I'll jump back here for just a second. Let me talk about Xcode for just a second. When you open uh, an Xcode project, you're going to have on the left hand side you're going to have the project uh, project files, um, and there's a little bit of uh, you know. A little bit of a learning curve to Xcode, of course, uh, as with any IDE. One of the things that's nice about processing is that it makes getting down to the code uh, really, really simple. And I almost thought, eh, maybe we should do this in processing today, but I thought it'd be good to talk about this because I think more and more you're going to run into this, especially if you're using um, other things like um, other multi platform. Um, uh, multiple platform uh, libraries or frameworks like Titanium uh, that you know go out to Android and to iPhone and to a bunch of other places. Um, all of these things have considerable IDEs that you have to learn. It can be kind of daunting. So uh, I'm I I hate Xcode on a daily basis, but it does do some things uh, nicely for me. I'm really feeling not good about not being able to see you guys, so let me log in and see if that helps. Come on, guys. Come on, chat. Send a tweet to um, 
variable res twitter.com slash variable res if you have any um, have any questions and I will sign into that right now so that you guys can ask questions will be very um, curious about some of these steps here if I miss something. So, okay, anatomy in Xcode, you're going to have uh, some of the project uh, details. It's going to be, you know, all of your files are going to be over here on the left-hand side. When you open an Open Frameworks project, it's going to be pretty much laid out for you. Uh, but if you are using any add-ons, you might need to drop them into this add-ons folder. So to do that, you're, you know, going to be opening Finder, and let me just show you a little bit of the anatomy of the Open Frameworks folder. When you download Open Frameworks, either pull it down as a Git project or just get a zipped version of it, you're going to have uh, an add-ons folder, an apps folder, and then these other folders, which you don't have to worry about as much. They're sort of the core nuts and bolts of Open Frameworks. Uh, your apps. These are where all of the example apps that come with Open Frameworks are going to be. And then uh, essentially you have sort of a primary folder. Inside the primary folder you actually have projects. And you have to keep that sort of a hierarchy um, because of how things are linked inside of these, these uh, applications. So if you wanted to make a, the easiest way to make a new project is just to copy an existing project. And you can actually go just into examples and grab an empty example copy it, go over to, this is where I'm storing my apps, and I can paste that in, uh, and then rename it, you know, box 2D example, for example. And then inside of it you have the Xcode project, you have your source files, and then when you start getting further into the project, in the bin folder, there's a data folder, that'll be where you store graphic assets, sound assets, etc. So um, there's a bunch of other little quirks uh, here in t terms of uh, changing the name of the project and all of that. But if you just want to get up and running fast, uh, you can just kind of copy a project. I'm going to delete that for now because we're going to copy. We're going to make a, a, a duplicate of this one, which is sort of what we're talking about. So inside the app itself, you're going to have three main files, which are in pretty much every Open Frameworks app. Um, I'm I'm running this as a Xcode project, so, or sorry, as a um, an iPad app uh, or iPhone app. It's using the iOS SDK or the iOS version of Open Frameworks, which, uh, you know, if you went go into iPhone examples and get an empty example there, that's going to be set up for the iPhone stuff just to save you the hassle um, of trying to convert a normal Open Frameworks project to an iPhone project. Um, you're going to see that these are MM files instead of CPP files. CPP files are more of the desktop file. MM files are more of the mobile file. Uh, not, not any difference in the file, really. Uh, just a naming convention. So uh, once you're in here, of these three apps, you're going to have this test app, which has an H and an MM. And then you have this main MM. The main MM file usually doesn't have too much in it. There's a little bit more in this because I'm setting this up to uh, sort of enable anti-aliasing. I'm also setting it up to handle a Retina iPad display so that you can really squeeze every pixel of the new display out. Um, I can talk a little bit more about this later, but most of this is done for you. I'm just essentially setting up that I want the device that you know, I want the, the landscape of the, of the, I want the device to be in landscape when it starts. So if we run this, it will look horizontal when it starts. It's still starting up. But then once it's finished starting, it's going to turn to the side. So lots of tweaking we can do when there's a final project uh, in place uh, to make that more seamless. But So what we have right now, 
is when I click or if this was actually running on an iPad, if I tapped, if I tapped with multiple fingers, all of those points would be registered at once. It's creating these balls which are dropping and there's a line connecting all of the balls together. The other thing you'll see, which we'll talk about in a second, is that well, the balls are interacting with themselves, bouncing off of each other. There's also this rectangle up here, which we'll talk about in a second, that is just taking up some space up here. And the balls are interacting with that. You'll see that there's a red point inside of red glowing insides to these balls when they stop moving. So all these movie, the, these balls in the middle here, still moving just a little bit, and then they finally came to rest. So this is given to us for free by the the library uh, that was or the the add-on that was created for this uh, to give us a little bit more information about the objects. There's a few other things that are given to us for free too. Uh, that's you know one thing we can use in terms of when we're doing some collision stuff. <coughs> okay, so right now, kind of kind of silly, but yeah, it's doing doing some stuff. We'll talk about what it's doing. Okay, so this main window, generally speaking, you don't have to worry about it too much unless you're doing sort of your initial setup of the application. Um, after you've done the initial setup, you know, getting the size right, most of this is going to be consistent on iPhone or iPad, so you don't have to uh, worry as much about this changing. In a desktop application, this might be changing quite a bit. Um, you know, as this, the screen is resized or whatever, that resizing of the screen is not really happening on a mobile device, so you don't have to worry about that as much. So, assuming that, you know, we can get back to some of this stuff later if we want, but getting into the test app.h, test app.mm, these are the kind of the, the real guts of the application. The h file in a C app or in an Objective C app is where you're sort of doing your declaration. So you're going to be declaring that you have some functions or some methods inside of this class, which is called test app. Um, what you're seeing here is that it's inheriting from OFX iPhone app. So all of the stuff that's in, an, and I'm doing a command click here. If you hold command and then click on this, it's going to go inside of the um, of that particular class. So now you're in the H file of that particular object and you'll see that it inherits from a bunch of other things as well from OF simple app, OFX iPhone alerts listener, OFX multi-touch listener. All of those things have uh, elements in them as well so if I click into one of them you'll see there's all sorts of stuff in here. There's all these defines for enumerators for um, different types of formats. All of these things that are convenience things for us this is the guts of Open Framework, so it's nice to be able to jump into there if you need to look up something. You don't have to jump in there all the time, especially once you start understanding what's going on. Um, you'll see inside of this OFX iPhone app, we have a bunch of these virtual methods that are created. These are things that essentially we get to take over and use in our own lab, own applications. So things like when someone touches down, you know, their, their finger has touched the screen hasn't released yet, well, that at that point when it touched, we'll get a, um, a method or a callback, a, um, a, an event that gets triggered in our app. Uh, if they're moving around the screen with their finger, we'll get that information. And you'll see that there's some parameters that are coming in there as well. So we get the X position, the Y position on the screen, and we get the ID of the touch. You know, since there's a multi-touch paradigm happening here, you might have three fingers that touch. And if they're all moving around at once, you're going to be getting a whole bunch of moved events, for example. These moved events are, um, you know, you're going to need to keep track of them as separate things or else, you know, if you're moving three different shapes around, the shapes might start jumping from one finger to the next. So these IDs uh, are, you know, handy for that. Um, touch double tap, touch canceled, etc. So uh, there's a bunch of other stuff in here in the, in this particular base class, just showing you that it exists. Uh, I'm gonna command control left arrow will back you out of something that you have um, 
command clicked into. So now we're back in our test app again. You'll see that the touch down, touch move, touch up, touch double tap, etc. All of those uh, methods we are now overwriting. Those virtual methods were essentially there as stubs. We're now taking control of them and using them in our, our own app. Um, and you'll see there's also some sort of remnants of uh, the example app that I had in here before. There's some texture information. There's also a boolean for whether or not this is a, a retina display or not, which we're not using too much. These are just uh, variables that we're instantiating here. So we're basically declaring that they exist, and then we're going to actually start doing something with them in the MM file. Um, there's, a, there's integers for width and height. There's also integers for uh, circular width, circular height. These are things from a previous example that sort of pulling out of the app. Um, so you can ignore almost all of these things up here. But we really want to talk about are these things down at the bottom here. We have an OFX box 2D called box 2D. This is this object that we're uh, going to be instantiating in a second. Essentially is where uh, all of the, the primary logic of a box 2D application takes place. It's sort of like the world, the, if you're thinking about it as a box, it's like the box that all the little objects are put into. And the box is keeping track of all the little things inside of it. Um, <clears throat> so we have to have one of those. It's, that's uh, absolutely necessary. We also have this box to the rect. This is that middle rectangle that's sort of hovering in the middle. Uh, we also have OFX box to the polygon. This is a dynamic floor element that we're going to put in in a little bit. We're just declaring it now. And then we have a vector. A vector is essentially an array or a container of a um, variable size. So in a lot of programming languages, if you're in JavaScript or if you're in, oh man, I mean, most, most languages uh, have convenience arrays that you can add and remove from very easily. Uh, in C++, uh, standard arrays have to be declared with a size. So you might have an array that you, when you create it, you say, I want it to be seven. I want it to have seven little separate containers inside of it, sort of like a medicine pillbox that people carry around that says, you know, the different days of the week. You, you would declare that with, you know, seven different little storage, storage compartments, and then you could put whatever different things you wanted in each of those. Um, kind of like when a manufacturer would create that object, they would need to know that there's seven things so that they can build the shape out to have that same amount of spaces every time as they're recreating that array or so that the person knows, oh, there's only seven different spaces. It's not like there's this mysterious eighth day that then throws off their whole schedule. They want that to be a fixed size. In programming, it's important to have a fixed size when you're a little bit lower level because uh, you need to know how much memory each of those little containers is going to take uh, so that you're not essentially writing stuff out into the ether. A vector essentially is a way of getting around that. It's a way of making a flexible uh, unit of space or uh, you know set of containers and you declare a type of object that you're going to be passing into that. What this does is in memory, we don't really know how much space that takes up because the compiler takes care of that for us. But we're going to be putting a bunch of box 2D circles inside of that. So by having a vector know what is going inside of it, it knows how big each of those little subcontainers is going to be, and it's able to like flexibly add to that list. So the syntax for that is you declare that you're making a vector because that's the type, sort of like you're declaring you're making a flexible array. That's what a vector is. And inside these triangle braces, you put OFX box 2D circle. All this stuff is able to be put into this uh, application because we've included OFX box 2D up here, which is the main uh, reference to the library. And that's inside of this add ons folder here. So if you're starting with an empty project, you might need to drop the OFX box 2D. Uh, 
instead of going into the apps folder, which I showed you before, you'd go into the add-ons folder, look for OFX Box 2D, and just drag and drop that into your add-ons. Some add-ons are a little bit more complicated for uh, adding to a project, but this one's pretty self-explanatory, so I'll actually remove that. I'm just going to remove a reference to it. I'm going to drop it back in again. And you'll see it brings up this little window which asks me if I want to copy items into the destination group folder or not. I don't want to do that uh, because I don't need duplicates of the library around. If you did that by accident, it's no big deal. It would just be inside of the project. But the way that this is laid out, it allows add-ons to be sort of outside of the app folders, but always in, a, in the same sort of file hierarchy so that you can jump, uh, you can always get to them. This is one of the reasons that all of the apps are inside of sort of a subcategory of apps and then in the app folder itself so that you can always reference back to those add-ons correctly even if you copy these things around in these directories. Anyway, so, okay, I don't need to copy that in there. Uh, and the rest of this stuff you can, you want to add any things that are in there to targets so that it'll compile correctly. Once you do that, then all of these things are going to get added. There's a bunch of examples in here as well. We might have to move those out if that's a problem later, but um, for right now we can ignore that. Okay, so because we're adding this H file, this is the primary H file of the library. If you go into add-on here, you'll see OFX box 2D. In the source, you'll see the H file. It's also connecting to a bunch of other things and bringing those into the project for us. So by doing an include like that, we're essentially getting a bunch of things for free into the application. So you'll see that that happened in the H file because we're declaring some of these objects here. Uh, you want to include that at the point, the earliest point in the application lifecycle, which the H, uh, the H file sort of declares everything. So most of the time you're going to be including things in here if you're using uh, types of objects that are in that library um, and declaring them in your class uh, before you actually start running it. So we're going to jump into the mm file, the uh, implementation. So declaration, implementation, uh, you're sort of declaring all the things you're going to use and then you're actually starting to use them here. Uh, the anatomy of each and every Open Frameworks app is you're going to have a setup uh, method, an update method, and a draw method. And these do exactly like you'd think. You sort of declare that they're going to happen here. They happen in every app. Um, the setup is going to allow you to set up some initial values for things. That happens once at the beginning of the application. And it doesn't happen again. Uh, the update the update and the draw methods happen at a, uh, a rate pretty much as fast as the uh, the processor can handle, or if you set the um, frame rate of the application, it'll run at that. Uh, so it runs, these run very frequently. The update area of the application, these are things that you want to have change values. If you're doing any changing of values, if you're deleting things, adding things, whatnot to your, to, uh, you know, your vectors or whatever, loud plane going by. If you're doing any of that stuff, you want to do it in the update uh, method. That's specifically what it's for. And then in the draw method, that's where you actually print things out to the screen using the values that have been updated by the, the update method. In, a, in an application like processing, the update and the draw methods are sort of integrated together uh, into the draw method just as a convenience thing. There are some nice advantages for having update and draw being separate not really talking about that today, but just something to note. Generally speaking, you want to update your stuff in the update method and then just draw it out in the draw method. And then you'll see down at the bottom here, we have these different uh, callbacks essentially for different actions that users are taking. So if they touch down, if they move, if they touch up, if they're pulling their finger back up off the screen, if they're double tapping or if they're canceling. Uh, for the most part, we're just using touchdown for right now. When they touch down on the screen, uh, 
then it's going to essentially create a circle at that location, give it some physics, and add it to the vector. So, okay, let's talk about what this does. Uh, at the beginning of the application, you in any iPhone application, you want to register for touch events. This is basically what tells the device uh, to start listening for taps and touches and things like that. We're also setting the orientation of the project so that it goes to the side. Um, this is setting some OF get width and get height are a way to get the size of the screen dynamically. So if we were on the iPhone and we wanted to know what the width was without knowing whether or not we're in an iPhone or not uh, versus an iPad, that's where this get width, get height comes in. So center width, center height is what these variables do. Uh, allows us to easily be able to uh, put something in the center of the screen. Set log level, this allows us to have some more logging. The logging comes out down here in this output, uh, this output window down here at the bottom. So uh, those are sort of the initial things that you'd want to be doing. You might not need to do this in a project, but you, you will want to set a log level and have, uh, you might actually not need that all the time, but you want to register touch events and you'll want to set your orientation if you want it to be like a, uh, a, a game that's played just on landscape. Uh, what we're doing next is this box 2D object, which if we jump back into our, uh, our um, declaration. We declared it here, but there's nothing really going on with it yet, so we want to initialize it, set the gravity. I'm giving some initial downward gravity of the um, the, the you know x and y coordinates, the y coordinates getting a little bit of gravity. So, for example, if we just turn that off and turned on a little bit higher of a, a gravity in the x direction, then, um, and I'm going to turn up the frame rate too so this goes a little faster. If we run this, you'll see that everything's relative, so these circles will start to drop to the right now. And, um, oh. We have a build failure. Let's see what that's about. Well, look what I did. I went and screwed up things by adding box 2D in the middle of the project. Let me see. So those other examples that we had were causing conflicts, so I got rid of them. Okay, so now we're in the project again. Uh-oh. <laughs> Didn't actually change anything. This is why live programming is so fun. Oh, I changed the gravity still in the y direction, so let me change it in the x direction. The first parameter is the x, the second parameter is the y. So I'm giving positive values here because the coordinate system that we use increases as we, you know, the top left would be 0, 0, the bottom right would be OFX get height and get, or get width and get height, the x and y being positive values. So if you give it a gravity in the positive direction is going to drop in that direction. And it's only bouncing off the side of the screen right now because we have given bounds to the application uh, for that. So we make a rectangle, we give it a, a starting location of 0, 0, we give it a width and height of the size of the screen, and then Box2D has a method called create bounds, which allows us to pass in a rectangle. And those bounds essentially contain all of the shapes, so it's essentially making your little box. Um, <clears throat> so, let me reset the gravity back to the y direction. Well, I mean, just for fun, if you want to see the gravity was, it was floating up like they were little balloons. If we give it a ne negative value, then we will have shapes that float up into the air. 
I'm going to talk about how these things are all getting created here in a second, but for now, just talking about the initial steps that go into getting Box2D working. And if you download Box2D as an add-on and get it in the right spot, it's relatively easy to get uh, these examples going. In fact, just to, um, I think I have some, I have another box CD example here. Let's see if this runs out the gate. I actually didn't line all of these up ahead of time. This is not using uh, iOS. I'm just going to jump in here real quick so you can see this. There's, of course, lots of little issues with getting a build to work. Okay. So, I won't get into all of the problems there. I did want to show you at least one other example. So let me see if this one works. If you're in Lion, what I'm doing here is essentially if you double click on the project yeah. itself, there's going to be build settings for the project. The base SDK for um, uh, if you're in Lion, you want that to be set to 10.6. It has some stuff in it that's not in Lion anymore, that's not in the newest version of Lion now. It causes some problems when you're um, linking things. Still getting some linker problems, so this is not in the cards. Might need to also. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. So, apologies on that. Getting back to the project that we're in. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I'll try to find some examples during the break too, so we can see some other stuff that um, people do. So, I'm going to comment, ignore that great. this commented stuff. I'm going to delete that. Okay, that sounds great. And I'm going to get rid of the user for right now and the dynamic floor so that. You just see at a bare minimum what is going on in the project. So we talked about we're initializing box 2D, we're setting the gravity, we're setting the frame rate. The frame rate essentially says even though you might get 300 updates a second, we want the frame rate to be a consistent 60 frames a second. Um, that way when the app is running, if, if you optimize the app to always run at at least 60 frames a second, then even if you're running much faster than that, it'll keep the you know the relative time of the beat of the, the application consistent so you wanna you wanna have something like that in place box 2d takes care of that for you um, there's nothing else really in the setup we just create the bounds off of a rectangle and then we're ready to go uh, nothing else will be rendered so I got rid of the, the the box that was in the middle I just commented that out so box still might try to draw so it might cause some little issues. We'll see. So we, we still have our gravity flipped around. Um, so there's just boxes and the bounds. There's just the big bounds and then the circles when we tap. That's it. Okay. Uh, in the update, all we have to do is call box2d update. These other two variables are not actually being used for anything right now. By doing box2d update, we're just telling it to, you know, keep up to date with the way things are changing, whatever objects are changing, make sure that all of those things are taken care of for us. And then in the draw loop, this is where we're actually drawing everything out to the screen. We're going to make a polyline. What a polyline is, is if you make a typical line, you're going to give it two points, the starting point and the ending point. It's going to draw a line between those. What a polyline does is allows you to add a bunch of uh, a bunch of different vertexes or points to uh, to the line. You can also say whether or not it closes. So it's kind of like a rubber band. You give it a bunch of points. If it's closed, then it'll wrap back around at the end. So it's like a rubber band being you know wrapped around a bunch of little nails that have been pounded into a piece of wood or something. Uh, and that's essentially what we're using this for. So we're creating a polyline fresh every time the draw loop runs. Uh, so we create it, we give it a name, surround, 
and then we pass in a method of set closed to true so that it closes itself off like a rubber band versus just drawing from each point to each point. And then we're going to do a for loop here. I'm not, I'm not really getting super basic about programming, so if you're not familiar with for loops, I encourage you to go play with processing or um, some of the initial examples in open frameworks uh, for that. But this is essentially us iterating through all of the circles that are in our vector. So the circles vector has a size method with it that'll say if there's 30 circles in it, it'll spit back 30. So this is going from 0 to to 29 exact, except essentially um, because it's less than the size. So 0 to 29 is essentially 30 times that it's passing through and it's incrementing that number as it goes. Uh, we're setting the, we're telling it to use a fill, we're setting the hex color to this value uh, and we're setting, uh, well we're setting the color twice, don't need to do that. Uh, we're setting the color to a gray, a darker gray color than the background and then uh, Open Frameworks has an ellipse method which allows us to draw an ellipse from uh, that circle. We're grabbing a reference to that circle in the vector, getting its position. That brings back an OF point which has an X and a Y attribute associated with it. Doing that for its X and its Y, we're doing that for, and then we're also getting the radius out of that circle, multiplying it by two so that we get the full uh, diameter of the circle and uh, doing that twice so that we have an actual circle versus an ellipse. Um, we could also do OF circle instead and just pass in three values, get rid of the second one so that you just set the diameter once. Um, I also have this little if statement in here that's saying if this circle is sleeping, that returns a boolean, true or false. If that's true, I'm pushing a style and popping a style. That way I don't have to worry about drawing something else red in the future setting the color to red and then I'm drawing an ellipse in here with the exact same uh, information as up here except for that I'm not multiplying the radius times two so it's essentially drawing a circle that's half as big inside or with half of a, the diameter inside of the original ellipse. Since the original ellipse was drawn first the second ellipse is drawn on top of it and that's why you get the little red belly. The last thing I'm doing is I'm taking the position of the circle and as a point I'm adding that as a vertex to this surround, this polyline, right? So as we go through not only are we getting all the circles, we're also getting all of the uh, circle positions. Uh, I'm then setting a color again and I'm now drawing that polyline, right? So since it wraps around it has all the points inside of it for all the different circles and it draws a polyline to connect all of them. So kind of like a little rubber band that connects all of them together. Last thing, well, I'm doing this and this also, which I'll talk about. Uh, this, these two things don't do anything yet because the dynamic floor hasn't been really created uh, or hasn't had any uh, methods applied to it and the user rect has not either. But we're drawing the ground, which is essentially uh, the, the elements that the, the circles are bouncing off of currently. Uh, last but not least, this is just a little debug window that's in a lot of the examples. It allows us to keep track of how many total bodies are inside of the Box2D project, so that's going to account for all of the vectors, all of the circles. It's going to account for uh, any of the boundaries, <coughs> shapes like that. Uh, and then we're also getting the frame rate, which is a, an open frameworks method, and printing that out in uh, this hex color as OF draw bitmap string. And this just gives us some feedback on screen. Last but not least, and then we're going to take a break, in this touchdown callback, it gives you a touch object. The touch object has an X and a Y. It also has an ID as well. If we go into touch event args, you're going to see that it has a bunch of stuff. It has an ID, a time, X, a Y, number of touches. There's um, you know, a lot of stuff that we can get out of that. Um, for right now, we don't need most of that. We just need the X and the Y. So I'm printing that out to the debug window. That's what all this stuff is down here. Uh, we're also setting the CW and CH uh, globals to that, which is not 
anything we're actually using right now, but that's something we could use to keep track of the last touch state if we wanted. Last but not least, we're making a new circle. We're setting the physics. This is just some arbitrary physics for if you do a command click on set physics, you're going to see that the first value is the density, the second value is the bounce, and the third value is the friction. This allows us to essentially have shapes that have different qualities in the physical uh, environment. One of them might feel like a brick, the other one might feel like a bouncy ball in terms of how dense they feel, how much they bounce off of each other. Um, these are obviously important for giving like a quality of natural quality uh, in the world to each shape. Uh, and then we're going to set up that circle. To set up that circle you have to essentially pass in the get world uh, element of the of box 2D that gets that circle uh, up and running in that environment. And then we're going to tell it to start at touch X, touch Y with a diameter of 10. Uh, the diameter's just being used later when it gets pulled back out to draw it, but we can set initial values for that now. So if we set that to OF random, OF random is a method for making a random number between, let's say, from 10 to 50. Um, well, last but not least, this pushback method, this is our vector, this pushback method allows us to actually push it into the vector, so we're adding it into the vector. But if I run this now that I have random set for that last um, attribute, you're going to see that every time we click on the screen, the ball is going to be slightly different size, but yet it's still going to collide with things at that size because we're setting that attribute initially. So you see there's much bigger balls this time. And you're also seeing it's a little jerkier when some of these things start to interact. Um, as there's more of them, there's more of this collision stuff to keep track of, so things can tend to slow down a little. You're also seeing things aren't coming to rest quite as quickly. Part of this is because of how much bounce they have. Uh, you see that they come to rest for a second, and they don't, and they come to rest again. So all of these things can kind of interact with one another if I, you know, just by adding a new shape next to that one, this one has to rest, it's all, it's moving everything around in very slight ways, so that's a very, it's a very tricky little Boolean state there, that is sleeping state. You see that these guys are kind of isolated by these other guys. This guy, for some reason, is always still moving for whatever reason. Um, so, it's something to keep in mind when you're building something, is that you might not be able to rely on some of these properties, you might have to look at other properties about them, like how, what kind of inertia they have innately what kind of velocity they have. If they're moving slow enough to the naked eye, it might appear that they're actually at rest, even though to the application they're not strictly at rest. Okay, so I'm going to take a short break here, this, and then we're going to get into actually doing something uh, that's more game-like in here after the break. So, be back in just a minute, and we'll go from there.